habari. Welcome and karibuni to Rooted Fellowship. My name is Naile Jileji and I will be your host for today. Rooted Fellowship is about three things. We are gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. We are also a giving church. We believe in giving of our time, talents, and treasures. We believe in giving this way because Jesus gave his all. If you would like to know more about how you can give or more about Rooted Fellowship, please visit our website. To those who are in need, we encourage you to speak to your city group leaders, discipleship group leaders, and where that's not possible, please send us an email at community at rootedfellowship.com and the church will try and meet you where you are. At this time, I invite you to join us in worship in a song. Come thou found of every blessing, tune thy heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. To raise our greater debt, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I. Here's my heart, oh, take it, seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take it, seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Last week, we finished off our series on 21 Days of Prayer, and this week, we are back with Mark Season 3. At this time, I invite you to listen to the sermon. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, perhaps, depending on when exactly you're watching this. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Stephen, and I'm one of the elders here at Rooted Fellowship. And uh, today I have the privilege of sharing from God's Word and doing so for the first time from our new studio. Um, we're here in the OM building uh, in Hatfield. Uh, we're so excited about this new building as a whole, but even now about a new space within the building. Uh, we've got this new studio and some awesome office space here outside. Um, and we're looking forward to having you all back here, or at least some of you back, for an in-person gathering uh, as from Sunday the 21st of February, just two weeks away. Uh, so very excited about the way God is continuing to provide 
for us as a church in these times. Today, uh, and for the next uh, few months actually, we're going to be returning to the book of Mark. Uh, if you've been with us for a little while on Rooted Digital, uh, you may remember that we've been uh, journeying through the book of Mark uh, and that twice last year we did a series in Mark. We did Mark season one and Mark season two. Uh, and today we starting off with Mark season three and episode one. And since the start of our journey through Mark, uh, we've been comparing this book to a binge-worthy TV series. Uh, I wonder what series you've been binging on throughout lockdown, uh, or maybe how many series you've binged on. Uh, Maybe you don't even have any left to watch. Uh, But the series of Mark uh, has been just like uh, some of the best uh, TV series, where uh, there's uh, there's a story, an overarching story that gets unfolded throughout the book, Uh, And the very first uh, line of the book even tells us what the overall story is about. It says, it's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then each episode in the series kind of unpacks uh, some events uh, that describe uh, and and fill us in on the overall story. Uh, Events that tell us uh, about who Jesus is, whether it's miracles, proving and demonstrating who he is. Uh, or debates that people have about who he is. Um, And like every good series, there are many twists in the book of Mark. And season two ended with a crazy twist. Uh, It's the kind of twist that perhaps you could have missed if you uh, have been very familiar with Christianity or with the Bible uh, for many years. If if you've been celebrating Easter for many years, um, you would have maybe missed just how intense this twist was. But if you were watching the series of Mark for the first time, it would have been a proper twist. Twitter would have been going crazy at the end of season two. So let's do a little recap. Previously in Mark, even though Jesus has been teaching about who he is and doing many miraculous signs to prove who he is, not everyone is understanding this. Some have rejected him outright, even saying he's from the devil, like the Pharisees did at one point in Mark. Others acknowledge that, well, he must be a prophet, uh, but they're not sure if he's much more than that. Maybe he's John the Baptist or Elijah reincarnated. Even the disciples who are spending a lot of time with Jesus are, are taking quite a long time to kind of realize who he actually is. But finally, midway through the book of Mark, Jesus turns to his disciples and he asks them, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter then answers him in chapter 8, verse 29, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. This is the brilliant moment when they finally understand that Jesus is in fact none other than God's promised Messiah, the one who would come to save God's people, to deal decisively with God's enemies, and to usher in God's kingdom in all its glory. It's an incredible moment in the book of Mark. And think about how exciting that must have been for the disciples. What would happen next? Would Jesus perhaps start training up an army to overthrow the oppressive Roman Empire? Perhaps the disciples would be elevated to positions of authority in this glorious new kingdom and live lives of luxury. But before they even have a chance to start contemplating the what next, uh, Jesus drops a bomb on them. Straight after Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, we read that immediately he began teaching them that the Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, and killed, and that he would rise again after three days. This makes no sense to the disciples at all. Suffering and death is not what they would have expected from the Son of Man. To appreciate this, we need to actually take a moment to think about what the Bible means when it uses the title, the Son of Man. Because Jesus is deliberately using the title here, and so is Mark throughout chapter 8 and chapter 9. Sometimes I've thought that the fact that Jesus is called Son of God and Son of Man is, is a way of demonstrating that he was both, or is both, fully God and fully man. And that is true, he is both God, fully God and fully man. But the way the Old Testament prophecies of of the Son of Man uh, are done is often that it's more about not just someone who can identify with us in our humanity and weakness, but rather this is about a strong leader who would come 
in power and glory from God. In Daniel chapter 7, we read of a vision that Daniel saw of the Son of Man. And it writes uh, that he saw in the night a vision. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so the disciples didn't understand. If Jesus is the son of man, why would he have to suffer and die? It doesn't match the expectation of a kingdom that would be greater than all kingdoms before it, a kingdom that will never be destroyed. If that isn't enough, there's still another twist. Not only must Jesus, the Son of Man, suffer and die, but Jesus says that if anyone would come after him, if anyone would follow him, they must deny themselves and take up their cross. Jesus goes on to say that whoever tries to save his life must lose it. And whoever loses their life for the gospel and for his sake will save it. You see, Jesus explains at the end of chapter 8 that the Son of Man will indeed come in his Father's glory, but first he must suffer and die. And the same pattern will apply to all who follow him. In this sinful and adulterous generation, as Jesus refers to it, we must not be ashamed of him and his word. I take this to mean that following Jesus will mean unpopular and costly obedience, ultimately losing our lives for his sake, in order that we may also share in his future glory. It's a very hard teaching, but it does come with a promise, a promise of future glory. That, Jesus, that just as Jesus must suffer, the promise is that he will rise again, and that those who follow him will suffer, but the promise is they too will share in future glory. This is a long recap of where we've come from in Mark, but I've taken the time to do so because I believe the next two scenes that we're going to look at in Mark chapter 9 relate directly to the teaching that Jesus has just laid out and directly to this massive revelation and twist that happened at the end of Mark chapter 8. The events that we're going to see in the next two scenes happen to encourage the disciples and us to strengthen their faith in who Jesus says he is and in God's promises of future glory and resurrection, while we persevere through the present realities of suffering and even death. We're going to be looking at two scenes. We'll look at them one at a time, but I want you to keep in mind how they might relate to each other and how they might relate back to the teaching uh, in Mark chapter 8. The first scene is often called the transfiguration. It's where Jesus goes up in a mountain and his appearance is transfigured and becomes brilliant and bright. The second scene happens when they come down the mountain and Jesus heals a boy with an evil or an unclean spirit. So let's read the first scene, uh, the scene of the transfiguration in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 13. Mark 9, verse 2 to 13. Read with me. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves to be alone. He was transfigured in front of them, and his clothes became dazzling, extremely white, as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah because he did not know what to say since they were terrified. A cloud appeared, overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept this word to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Then they asked him, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Elijah does come first and restores all things, he replied. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? 
But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did whatever they pleased to him, just as it is written about him. Let's pray together and ask God to help us understand what's going on here. Father, we thank you so much that you have revealed yourself to us in your word. And as we reflect on your word this morning, I pray, Father, that uh, you would take away any distractions, that you would help us to just pause our thoughts and our hearts to hear from you, to focus on you. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would do the work of opening the eyes of our hearts, that you would help us to believe and understand correctly and clearly more of who you are. God, I pray that you would cause faith to rise up in our hearts this morning as we believe and know something more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, there's quite a lot going on in this scene. It's quite a dramatic event. Jesus took three disciples, Peter, James, and John, three key eyewitnesses, but perhaps also significantly only three, maybe because what is revealed to them here is intended to be secret for a little while. We'll talk more about that later. They go up together up a high mountain, kind of similar to some of the Old Testament occasions where God revealed his glory up on mountains to people, like to Moses and to Elijah. And Jesus is now joined by Moses and Elijah on this mountain, and he is transfigured. We're told that his clothes become whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Now, at this point, I just need to emphasize that the series of Mark is not proudly brought to you by any particular washing powder brand that might claim to wash sheets whiter than white. No, the point here is not so much about uh, washing powder or, or bleaching, but what Mark is saying is that by, by saying Jesus' clothes were whiter than any, anyone in the world could bleach them, he's really saying that he's more brilliant and bright than anything that had ever been seen in the world. This is a picture of something out of this world. It's a picture of Jesus in his glorious resurrection body. It's a revelation, in a way, of the true Jesus. In, in a way, the real miracle is that Jesus lived on earth and hid his glory from everyone else. And so here, the disciples are simply given a glimpse of the true and real Jesus, who he really is. The next thing that happens is that our dear friend Peter makes a fool of himself, as he often does. Here he suggests that they put up three shelters, one for each of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And I'm not sure if he says this just because he's scared and panics and doesn't know what to say, but being Peter decides that it's better to say something. Um, or maybe Peter thinks that this is much better than uh, going back down the mountain to the realities of life and following through with Jesus' plan of suffering and death. But either way, whatever Peter's trying to get at, nobody pays much attention to his suggestion. We then read that they are surrounded by a cloud. Uh, another Old Testament allusion, perhaps, to God's presence with his people. And then God speaks audibly from the cloud. And he says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And soon thereafter, Moses and Elijah disappear, and the disciples are again alone with Jesus. So what is the meaning of this extraordinary event? Well, clearly, the transfiguration provides a revelation or a glimpse of who Jesus really is and of his glory. But it also provides a powerful testimony to validate the claims of who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of Man. How does this event validate these claims? Well, firstly, the mere appearance of Jesus, um, being brilliant and brighter than anything ever seen on earth, this confirms his true identity despite his humble appearance and life on earth. Secondly, uh, the fact that Moses and Elijah are the ones who appear with him is significant. You see, Moses is often understood to, to represent the law because he wrote much of the law in the Old Testament. And Elijah is considered one of the greatest prophets. So together, Moses and Elijah are representatives of the law and the prophets. In other words, all of Old Testament scripture. And so their presence alongside Jesus validates uh, the claims uh, that all of the Old Testament is actually about Jesus. Jesus himself in the book of John explains to his disciples that the law and the prophets are all pointing towards him. 
The third way in which this event uh, confirms who Jesus is, is the voice of God himself speaks uh, and tells us, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. It's significant that in the presence of Moses and Elijah, whose words would have been understood by Jewish people at the time to have been the most authoritative words there are, that God says, listen to Jesus. It's very significant. But why then does Jesus take the disciples up the mountain for this event at this moment? Why now do they need this assurance of who he really is, this glimpse of him in his true glory? Well, remember that Jesus has just very unexpectedly taught them that the Son of Man actually must suffer and die, and so must all who follow him. And there's also the promise that he made there of future glory, of resurrection, that those who lose their lives for his sake will share in his future glory. And what's interesting about that teaching in Mark chapter 8 is that it ends with a somewhat mysterious promise from Jesus. He says that some who are standing here will not, fa- will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God coming in power. It's a strange promise and confusing to us because we know that the disciples did die and Jesus has not yet come again. So what could Jesus have been referring to? Well, perhaps the simplest explanation is that Jesus' promise is fulfilled right away with the transfiguration. It does happen as the very next thing after the promise. And Mark even writes, after six days, Jesus led them up a mountain. So maybe the tone is something like, and sure enough, after six days, Jesus led them up a mountain and they saw the kingdom, etc., etc. So I think Jesus is giving the disciples a glimpse of his glory to reassure them that he really is the glorious son of man, that he will rise again, even though there's first going to be a time of suffering and death. It's also interesting that as they come down the mountain, Jesus warns them not to tell anyone about what they'd seen until after the son of man had risen from the dead. And this is not the first time that we see Jesus issuing gagging orders to the disciples or to anyone to not tell about who he is. I managed to count seven previous occasions in the book of Mark where he warns people or even warns demons not to say who he is. I've always found that a bit strange. You know, why would Jesus prove who he is and teach about who he is, but then tell people not to share who he is? And I think the answer is that it's a matter of timing that Jesus doesn't yet want to reveal only part of the story. He knows he first has to go to the cross. And only then will he be happy for the story and the full revelation of who he is to be shared. It would be too soon for everyone to be recognizing him as the Son of Man. First, he has to go to the cross and rise again from the dead. But in the meantime, this transfiguration event is given to the disciples Uh, as a foretaste, as a glimpse of what is to come to strengthen their faith as they first go through this this road of suffering and Jesus' death. And indeed, we see that this event left a lasting impression on the disciples. In the book of 2 Peter, where Peter writes uh, a letter, uh, Peter wants to assure the readers of the reliability of the gospel message. And as he's talking about the reliability of scripture and of the gospel message, he lists this transfiguration event as evidence. Uh, He writes that we did not follow cleverly invented stories, but we ourselves were eyewitnesses and heard the voice from heaven proclaiming, this is my son whom I love. And so we also can be assured by this event. We may not have been eyewitnesses ourselves, but we know that those who first spread the gospel message, those who wrote scripture for us, they were eyewitnesses. And they did so based on the highest authority and the clearest revelation of who Jesus is. So that's the transfiguration. The second scene that we're going to look at now in Mark 9 is where Jesus heals a boy with an evil spirit. And we're going to see that it's also there to confirm who Jesus is and to strengthen the disciples' faith that he will rise again and that he does have resurrection power. Let's read the second scene together. Mark 9. Verses 14 to 29. Mark 9, 14 to 29. 
And it happens immediately as they come down the mountain. We read, when they came to the disciples, this is the rest of the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes disputing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. He replied to them, you unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said. And many times it has thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was quickly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then it came out, shrieking and throwing him into terrible convulsions. The boy became like a corpse, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him up and he stood up. After he'd gone into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he told them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer. So Peter, James, and John come down from the mountain with Jesus and straight back to reality. A typical argument between the teachers of the law and the disciples. Neither side seems to be winning this argument. Uh, neither side seems to have their hearts in the right place. Uh, we know that instead of successfully dealing with successfully healing this boy, the disciples were unable to do so. And instead, the desperate situation of this poor boy has degenerated into a religious argument. From the mountaintop experience of the revelation of the Son of Man and all his glory, we're back to the real world of religious fighting, unbelief, and this terrible situation of a boy and his desperate father. The boy's father understands that his son is possessed by an evil or an unclean spirit, which has made him both deaf and mute. And the situation really is desperate. Ever since the boy's childhood, this spirit has been tormenting him, giving him seizures, throwing him to the ground, throwing him into fire and water, trying to kill him. In fact, throughout this passage, the boy's situation is described using the language and imagery of death. Aside from the reference that the spirit was trying to kill him or destroy him, uh, we see that the boy foams at the mouth. We see he becomes rigid. That sounds a bit like death. And then when Jesus does expel the spirit from the boy, he convulses so violently that afterwards we're told that he looked like a corpse, like a dead body. So much so that many people there thought he was dead. And then... Just as Jesus had done with a dead girl a few chapters earlier in Mark, we're told that Jesus took the boy by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up, reminding us of Jesus' ability to raise from the dead. And this is significant in the light of what he's just been teaching about the fact that he will rise again and that those who lose their lives will one day save their lives. Just as in the transfiguration event, here Jesus has again provided some proof or assurance that he really is the son of man, that he really does have the power to rise again from the dead, that he has the power to raise others from the dead. He's given again a glimpse of his future glory, of his resurrection power that those who follow him will one day participate in. 
And Mark clearly wants us to believe this. He wants us to believe it, to have some faith. I wonder if you noticed throughout this story of the boy and the evil spirit, there's a repeated emphasis on the idea of faith or of belief or of unbelief. When Jesus arrived at the scene, he immediately diagnosed their problem. Oh, unbelieving generation, he exclaimed. And it probably is the case that even with the disciples, there's something deficient in their faith because they were unable to heal the boy themselves. And Jesus tells them, this kind can only come out by prayer. Now, I don't think that that his response there means that there are certain kinds of demons or certain kinds of evil that are just so powerful that some extra special kind of prayer is needed in order to get healing or deliverance. Uh, No, I think the meaning here may be as simple as that the disciples had maybe not even prayed to God. They had not turned to Jesus for help. Perhaps they were trying to cast out the demon in their own strength rather than putting their faith in Jesus. But the story does have someone who provides a positive example of faith, an example that we can follow. And this person's faith is not the kind of faith that only a few super Christians might have. No, the boy's father comes to Jesus in desperation and in humility. If anything, this father's faith seems weak. If if you can do anything, please help. The boy pleads with Jesus. Now, I, I know that I wouldn't stand up in church and pray, God, if you can do anything, please help us. I wouldn't do that because I know it's not going to look like a good example of faith. Of course, God can do things. But the reality is, if I'm honest with myself, when I'm really struggling, when I'm really anxious and desperate, that kind of a prayer feels more honest. That sometimes I'm like, oh, can you please help? Is there anything you can do? Maybe it's a more accurate reflection of where our faith is at sometimes. Of course, Jesus responds to this, if you can, request. He says, if you can, everything is possible for him who believes. Everything is possible for him who believes. Now, let me just say that I don't think that is like a blanket guarantee that God's going to give us everything we ask for. We could say a lot about why that's not the case. um, But let me just say that I think that I don't think it means God will give us everything we ask for, but I think it does mean that God can do all things. In fact, the Bible tells us that he can do even more than we ask or imagine. But let's not be distracted here from the encouraging example of this father's faith. After Jesus says everything is possible for the one who believes, the boy's father then says something really interesting. He says, I do believe Help me in my unbelief or help me overcome my unbelief as it sometimes is translated. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. It's a very interesting request. It's an honest and humble but really powerful prayer. What could be better and more in line with God's will than to ask God to help us overcome our unbelief? It's a great prayer to pray. We can pray that prayer with faith because God will answer that prayer. And Jesus then heals the boy. And so I think we're left with this contrast between this man's very humble yet effective faith and the unbelief of the teachers of the law and the disciples. Here we have an example we can follow. You don't have to wait until one day when you have a very strong and perfect faith. You don't have to be in a position of Christian leadership. You don't have to wait until one day when you have a miraculous vision or special sign or sense of God's presence. You can turn to Jesus right now. You can ask him to help you to believe. It's not so much how much faith you have as much as who you put your faith in. The father in the story did not have a rock solid and perfect faith. It's not as if he never struggled with doubt. But he put his faith in Jesus And Jesus, full of gentleness and compassion, was willing and able to heal the boy. This is such an encouragement for all of us. It's an encouragement literally for every single person listening today. That nobody is too weak or too far to come to Jesus. We can come just as we are, 
in humility, in desperation, and we can put our faith in Him. We can have a little faith. If we put these two accounts together, the transfiguration and the healing of this boy with the unclean or evil spirit, we can say that both of these events reveal and prove who Jesus is, that he really is the promised son of God, promised son of man, with power to rise from the dead and to raise others from the dead. Remember, these two events came immediately after Jesus dropped the shocking news that yes, he is a son of man, but first he must suffer and die. And so must those who follow him. And so both of these events are given as an assurance that although there is temporary suffering for those who follow him, his future resurrection, the glory that he's spoken about, these things are real. Both events are given for the strengthening of the disciples' faith and for the strengthening of our faith. These events gave the disciples a sneak preview of how the story would end. Jesus is saying, Just hold on, just have a little faith. And so as we continue through the struggles of our time, and we know we're going through some of the roughest times, but we, and we may even in this time, as Christians following Jesus, we may have to make difficult life choices, sacrificial choices, but we can know that it's all worth it. It does make sense to lose your life now in order to save it later. Jesus really is going to return in his glory. He's going to restore all things. That day is surely coming. But for now, have a little faith. We know how the story ends. But how? How can we have faith? How do we grow in our faith? In a way, we also need to see the transfiguration for ourselves. We need to see Jesus. We need the miracle of faith. Uh, And the miracle of faith is described beautifully in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where it says that the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, also made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Just as the transfiguration provided a glimpse of future glory in order to sustain the disciples through the coming trials, In the same way, 2 Corinthians 4 goes on to teach us that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. It goes on to say, and so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's what faith is. Hebrews teaches us faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the transfiguration for the disciples. It was the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so this miracle of faith happens as we fix our eyes on Jesus. One of the best ways we can fix our eyes on Jesus is by immersing ourselves in Scripture. This is where He is written about. This is where His words have been preserved for us. And indeed, faith comes by hearing the word of God, as Romans teaches us. All of Scripture is a witness to Jesus, as he himself taught. All of the law and the prophets point to him. We do have Moses and Elijah with us, testifying to who Jesus is. So don't wait to have faith. You can exercise faith as you seek God. Faith is not just something that you have. It's also something you can exercise. You can step out in a little faith by turning to Jesus. There's so many promises in Scripture of how when we seek God, He wants us to find Him. In Matthew, we read, Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And so the exercise of faith is a matter of seeking Him, of coming to Jesus, not of waiting to have a perfect faith. So today, let's have a little faith. Let's hold on to our hope that Jesus is everything he says he is. And as we hold on to our faith in these difficult times, and as we commit again to following him, we can be assured he will one day return in glory. He will restore all things. He will restore and he will reward those who have believed 
in him. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you and we praise you for Jesus. We praise you for the victory that he had over sin and death. We thank you that he rose again, giving us hope that we too will rise again with him. We thank you that through Jesus you have forgiven us, you have reconciled us with yourself, and you've given us a very real hope that we can hold on to, a hope that is certain, that we will one day share with him in glory. But Father, help us now, help us in the meantime, as we go through difficult times, Lord, really difficult things and circumstances. Please help us. And we pray for a miracle in this time, Lord. We pray for the miracle of faith. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you, you are the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we would see Jesus, that we would believe in him. Lord, we recognize that we cannot do this by ourselves. We need your help. But we thank you, Lord, that you are such a good father to us, that you want to help us. You want us to believe. So we pray, Father, today, Lord, help us overcome our unbelief. Help us to know you more, to love you more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, 
We've come to the end of our service. We pray that you've been blessed throughout our time together. We normally end the service with a benediction or a good word. Today's benediction comes from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. And it says, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen. Please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Have a blessed week. Thank you.